Mickey Sagusa is currently the most reoccurring character to appear in a kaiju series, period. Which that alone is pretty cool, but who is she? And after rewatching all the Heisei Godzilla movies, I, I found her to be quite an interesting character, especially when you're trying to dissect it. She's often the butt of jokes on Godzilla groups, and yes, I can say I'm part of those. You know, I, I participated in, ta in, in making fun of her. I'm not bashing people who don't like her or anything because, yes, I do think some of those complaints are absolutely genuine. Uh, things... These things include, like, saying she's too preachy, ha or has nothing to do with some of the films, stuff like that, yes. But I blame the writing for this more than the actual actress, who did try to do as much with the character as she could. And even with those genuine problems I just stated, I do like her. I like her a lot. Miki Sagusa, for good and for bad, is someone I think deserves a genuine character study. So that's what I'm doing. But we need some backstory. We've heard the complaint that people find it silly that Japan was so invested in psycho-telekinesis field or psychic powers and stuff like that in Godzilla vs. Biolante. That is established in Godzilla vs. Biolante and is the thing that continues throughout the rest of the movies. Let me go over some history because, yes, with a modern viewpoint looking back at it, it's absolutely silly. But a lot of people don't realize that in the 1970s and 80s, this time period was a hub for this kind of research. Both America and Russia heavily invested militarily in this realm. So who is Mickey? An extremely young lady who appears to have telekinetic powers, who gets roped into the military, aka the JGSDF. A lot of who Mickey is was done by accident due to the process called back-end writing. This is when you basically create things a piece at a time and is the way most TV and cinematic universes are actually made today. You create one thing, then figure out what happens next, and so on and so forth. There's no grand strategy to the whole thing. Now, this isn't as bad as it sounds. I do prefer the other way, but I look at a show like Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which was made this way, and it remains to be my favorite Star Trek show and one of the best written shows ever. Avatar The Last Airbender was the same way. They had the basic overview, the basic overarching plot, but made the details as they went along. Uh, Zuko, for example, he was supposed to be the main bad guy and then he wound up becoming a good, a good guy by the end of the show. That was back-end writing. There are genuine benefits to this, just as there are front-end writing where you you know, come up with everything in advance. With Heisei Godzilla, they had no idea if what they were currently making would be the last Godzilla film or not. So yes, this series is a textbook example of back-end writing. With that out of the way, onto Mickey herself. You look at who she is and what she does in Godzilla vs. Biolante, and what we see is an extremely introverted girl who can be classified as a recluse, just like Dr. Shiragami. You don't know why, though it is hinted that it's because of her powers. Uh, this organization did not exist during the harshest part of Mickey's adolescence, and by the time of Biolante, her teenage years are just about over. So it's no wonder that later we'd see Mickey being so gentle and warm with especially children within the facility where they aren't perhaps shunned but warmly embraced. It is in this organization that we actually get a an important character to counter Mickey in Godzilla vs. Destroya, where you know, she was raised in this facility. She's sort of the opposite of who Mickey is. In fact, right through Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, we see that Mickey is always a bit of a loner. In King Ghidorah, we see her all alone watching the UFO right from the get-go. She's on her own to try to find Godzilla when she feels he is alive. She watches Godzilla when everyone else is basically left. Sure, there's somebody there, but it's mainly focused on her, and she's in her own little world. In Mothra, she's always quiet, trying to find the cosmos, concentrating mainly on the task at hand. And in Mechagodzilla 2, she begins to open up, especially after meeting Godzilla Jr., and that begins her opening up arc her actual embracing of other people, other individuals, and even making friends with them. She saw warmth in Godzilla Jr., and even the relationship between the Pterodon freak and the woman Jr. sees as his mother. And the scene where Mickey tells Jr. to go with Godzilla is essentially the beginning of their relationship, the relationship between Mickey and Godzilla Jr., as well as Godzilla himself in many ways. Uh, because of this bond, Mickey no longer sees Godzilla or Jr., 
as a monster and, and more of a, well, an animal more than anything else. While, while people like General Aso, who are working the same organization, just see them as an enemy that needs destroying. Mickey thought this way, the same as General Aso. Uh, all the way back in Biolante, uh, to the beginning of even Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. And the proof is how quickly she's on board with the race and Godzilla from history in King Ghidorah. She's on board with the idea right from the get-go. Then comes Space Godzilla. And though it is awkward, Mickey does form a bond and even a relationship with Shinjo. Yes, the writing could have been better, but I thought the actors did well together and the final act I genuinely liked. She has a bond to Shinjo, and Shinjo has a bond to her. And I did smile when Mickey and, and him hold hands at the end when they're walking down the, the uh, shoreline. That is the most physical contact she's really had with anyone, if you look at this entire series. And what I mean by that is physical contact that's not really necessary. It is done by her own will just because she wants to, not because she needs to. This contact was done out of genuine affection and friendship. And I do think it's too bad they don't even reference uh, Shinjo or this relationship in Godzilla vs. Destroya. Maybe just add a line where Mickey says she'll be seeing Shinjo or something, uh, you know, later that night or something like that. Something just to sell that the bond wasn't for nothing and wasn't just solo to Space Godzilla. Again, just a little tiny string, bit of string continuity to kind of tie these movies better together. This is, again, one of the consequences of back-end writing. Because they had no plan, her and Shinjo's relationship was just dropped in favor of her relationship with Godzilla Jr., which, let me just say, her relationship with Godzilla Jr. in Godzilla vs. Destroya is phenomenal, but we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. But even with Godzilla, she has opened up. She naturally becomes this voice of consciousness for G-Force, and even Shinjo. Shinjo in Space Godzilla just wants to kill Godzilla. And through Mickey, he learns to look at Godzilla, perhaps not as open-minded or in admiration as Mickey, certainly, but definitely with respect. And I also love it when Mickey says fuck it and runs straight into danger to try to help Shinjo after Mogera was in trouble. She didn't have to do that. That's the key in her character development. She didn't have to. And I don't think she would have done this if she was the same character in Biolanti. She would have certainly charged into danger. We see this in Biolanti, in King Ghidorah, in Mothra. But those were always because you know, she was ordered to. Which, which this goes into the next trait that I wish to discuss with Mickey. Mickey is someone who is extremely loyal and dutiful. And this goes throughout the entire series. Uh, here's to list a, a few key examples. In Godzilla vs. Biolanti, she stays on the flight rig to try to stop Godzilla, despite her chances of succeeding being slim to none. Instead of getting out of there and running, she ignores Asuka and the pilots and just immediately gets to work, as she was told to do. She was given an order by people who treated her warmly, or treated her, you know, better than most people, and now she was going to deliver. And it does indeed harm her. We see her pass out. And I, I really do love this scene, and I think it is the beginning of her as more than just exposition dump plot device, as more than just a MacGuffin. In Godzilla vs. Mothra, she agrees to help the Cosmo defend the Earth when they have to leave, and this is because Godzilla killed Batra. Now Mothra has to destroy the meteor that would destroy the Earth. They place Mickey in charge of defending the Earth, which becomes important in Space Godzilla. In Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, she agrees to destroy Godzilla's second brain, despite being morally against it. She sees it as her duty, and through her loyalty of G-Force itself. And in the same movie, we get Godzilla Jr., who she vows to protect, which forms the entire arc for the remainder of three movies. Uh, it's the whole crux of the decisions that she makes. In Space Godzilla, we have the cosmos telling her to protect the Earth, reminding her to uphold her end of the bargain, which is why she goes along with Operation T, travels to the island, and then agrees to stay in order to figure out what Space Godzilla is. It also shows her fascination and dedication to Godzilla Jr. And then finally, in Godzilla vs. Destroyer, we see her actively protesting G-Force's call to use Jr. as bait, but does so anyways because, yes, she knows what would happen if she doesn't. It's her duty to do so, and she will. And I always loved that about her, especially in Godzilla vs. Destroyer, where I believe the actress for Mickey gives her best performance. Seriously, that scene where Junior dies and she just loses it, it's just gut-wrenching. And then 
to see Mickey, who's usually usually manages to be warm and, and even somehow turn a smile, even in bad situation, she turns angry. And the way she spins around and says, Godzilla won't let this be its final fight. I mean, the things she's devoted to the last few years of her life, you know, she's devoted herself to defending, studying, and even simply to understand it. The things she's formed a strong bond with was just killed. And to make it worse, she was partially the reason it happened. Wonderful performances here. Just wonderful chills. <laughs> That's su Godzilla vs. Destroy is such a damn good movie. <laughs> to make things more interesting, it is established she's losing her powers in Godzilla vs. Destroy. So she's essentially being replaced by someone who had grown up in that very same facility, that same organization she had essentially been a prototype for. And this character is Meru Ozawa. And unlike Mickey, Ozawa has been raised as she once had, that Godzilla is an enemy and an enemy that needs to be destroyed. And what I find the most fascinating here is that it's not like Mickey doesn't realize this and irrationally leaps to Godzilla's defense, though some of her lines in Space Godzilla would certainly beg to differ. In Godzilla vs. Destroya, at least Mickey still defends Godzilla, but does her job anyways because, yes, Mickey knows that something bad's gonna happen if she doesn't, especially with Godzilla's meltdown and the end of the world being imminent. After all, Mickey doesn't need to go with Ozawa when Ozawa is tasked in turning Junior to make him head towards Tokyo. But she does so anyways, and that's what I find interesting. And though she hesitates for a brief moment, Mickey closes her eyes and helps Ozawa do what Mickey doesn't want. She goes against her own personal beliefs because she knows the consequences of what's going to happen if she doesn't. And she basically leads to Junior's death. And take note of what both women are doing. They are holding hands. And that is... And, and what is holding hands? It's, it's a bond. Tying into what Mickey did with Shinjo, which this was perhaps done unintentionally, but the line was nonetheless drawn. Which is why I wish Shinjo was at least brought up in Godzilla vs. Destroya through dialogue or something. It, it was at least a happy accident. God, I, I fucking love this shit. I, I love Godzilla vs. Destroya so much. People who say there's nothing good in the Godzilla franchise from 89 are, from, you know, 89 onwards are, are idiots and need to stay in the black hole known as Toho Kingdom. It could have been so easy to just make Mickey the person who wants to keep Godzilla alive, blah, 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 James Cameron writing, blah, blah, blah. But no, I, I applaud Kazuo Omori's treatment of Mickey and Godzilla vs. Destroya especially. It made her much more compelling. So yeah, that's essentially Mickey and a study of her character. And, and for those who say she's boring or never changes, really look again. Compare simply her performance in Biolanti to that in Destroya. You cannot convince me that that is the same woman. I really like her as a character, despite those genuine flaws that I mentioned before. She's a big inspiration, perhaps as a prototype, for the characters I put into the Godzilla saga, the series that I've been writing forever. Uh, she's part of the reason that I look back at the Heisei series and say that it's my favorite Godzilla era. Perhaps not visually, but certainly in terms of story, characters, and plot. Mickey just brought a humanity to this series, especially from Mechagodzilla 2 onwards, that was really needed for this series to become more than just a standard monster v. monster clash of titans. And it's something that even Sh uh, Shizuke Kaneko would copy over into his Heisei Gamera movies, which we all know how good those are and how successful those movies are. So go on Facebook, Like AM Productions, for all up-to-date information of what we're doing there. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, all of the links are in the description below. And in the end, this is Adam Noyce of AM Productions saying sayonara. Sayonara.